everybody. Welcome back. It's good to have you back here again for her Youth Sunday School. Last week, David talked to you about the cost of discipleship. And when he talked about that, he referred quite a bit to football or actually any sport for that manner. And it talked about when you're a player, there are a lot of hard knocks. There are a lot of ups and downs. It's tough. Sometimes you have to really give it so much effort. And then it still seems like you're going to lose the game, but you have to keep trying and keep pushing through. Now, there are the people out there on the field playing, and then there are also those people in the stands. And those people in the stands, they're spectators. They are watching, but they're really not participating. I know they're cheering you on, but they're really not not participating. So when the coach is trying to make a play, he doesn't look to those spectators and try to get their help. He looks to the players. He puts them in because he wants them to get the job done and he is depending on them to get the job done to help win the game. Well, the same thing applies to discipleship. God isn't just calling us because he wants us to go to heaven. He doesn't want us to just be spectators in this life and watch it go by after we accept him as our savior. He wants us to be disciples. He is calling us to do his work and that means we're going to have some ups and downs. It's not always going to be easy, but we're being called. Well, that was what Jesus was teaching when he was here on earth. Today we're going to continue that lesson and talk about treasure. This week we're looking at Luke 12, 15 through 28, and also verses 31 through 34. So Kelly, would you mind starting us with a prayer? Okay. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody that's joining us to learn more about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your son that you brought down to earth and gave us that treasure. And be with us while we're doing this lesson and make it to your glory. In your name, amen. Amen. Okay. I know it's only July, but I saw one of those Christmas in July ads recently. It's too early. Way too early. <laughs> but it made me think of Christmas movies. And one of my favorite ones is The Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is a very rich man, very wealthy, but he was also very greedy and kind of conceited because he always wanted to keep that money and everything to himself. Part of that movie he was talking about the ghosts that came to visit him. Ghost of past, present, and yet to come. Ghost of past, Talked about his childhood as he's growing up and everything. Present, where he's at right now. And the one in the future, that's the third one. That's kind of the scary one. And it really hit home because it talked about how he held all those worldly possessions, never spent it on anything, and eventually died alone. There's so much more to offer here on earth than keeping those earthly possessions. So this week, again, like Denise said, we're going to talk about treasure. Uh, we're going to read Luke 12, 15 through 21. Starting with verse 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A, life's, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty laid up for many years. Take my feezy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. The story really hits home for me, all of these verses do, primarily because we're getting ready for a garage sale, so we have lots of stuff to price, and we have to figure out how much it's worth. And in addition to that, we're also doing a lot of work on our house, and we're doing that, hoping that it's going to increase the value of our house, of course. But then when I read these verses, I look back and go, oh, what is that house really worth? Is it really worth what we're doing for it? But that's a lot like modern day Americans. Everyone's always looking for bigger and better, bigger cars, bigger houses, bigger jobs, bigger paychecks. Well, in these verses, Jesus begins them by warning about a man who stored up his riches, but he's going to lose his life that very night. And when he loses his life, he's not going to be able to take those things with him. In verse 20, he asks the man, the things you've prepared, whose will they be? It's really kind of a morbid story, but it's true. You can't take it with you. 
So if you can't take it with you, is it wrong to have nice things though? Not necessarily wrong to have nice things. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 7, the woman who prepared Jesus for burial, anointed his feet with expensive oil, wasn't shamed for having the oil, instead commended for her faith. The issue is, is when we hoard them for ourselves and for our glory, it's better for us to do that for the use in God's glory. In these verses, the man who thought he was smart and was storing everything up, preparing, was called a fool. In Genesis 1, 27 through 28, our Creator makes us stewards of our resources of the earth. It's our job to take care of the resources, but we need to know and remember that it truly belongs to God. It's not ours. Our possessions are just temporary, on loan from God. When we give God our treasures, then the treasures are a mighty tool for His kingdom. So then how can we be sure we're using our treasures for God's glory and not for our own glory? Well, I think that's where we need to start looking at the next set of verses. So let's read verses 12 through 28, or 22 through 28, pardon me. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or, or your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than those birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? You know, I love these verses because it's a, such a strong reminder that I don't need to worry. God's got this. These are really stressful times that we're living in. There's so much going on in the world. We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of racial unrest. And there is even a big election coming up. And so there's a lot of tension between the parties regarding that. So with all of that focusing in, especially if we focus on the news, worry can so creep in. When we worry about those earthly things, we take our focus away from God and his eternal goodness and provision. But in these verses, Jesus points out that even the lilies of the fields, they have no ability to care for themselves, but yet they are adorned more beautifully than King Solomon himself. Whether we are as rich as Solomon or as poor as the poorest of God's kingdom, God is taking care of us. He's going to supply all of our needs. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. Instead, we're supposed to endure our suffering as an opportunity to testify and glorify the Father. Yeah, we're going to suffer probably. Like you said earlier, God's the one in control. The last part of verse 28 talks about how God makes the grass beautiful today, knowing that it's going to be hay tomorrow. Truly, how much more will he do for us? Us of little faith. Of little faith. Let's read the last of the focal verses, verses 31 through 34. Starting with verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's recap just a bit. In the first set of verses, verses 15 through 21, Jesus talks to us and warns us about how the love of money and treasures can cause greediness and makes us hold on to things that we don't have in our own control, that we can't take with us when we die. Then in verses 22 through 28, he warns that the love of money can cause us to worry. So if we're holding on to those things, we begin to feel like we have no control of those things. And then we have to worry about how do we keep them. And then we feel like we're losing control. We worry about losing control of our home, of our possessions. We even worry about losing control of our own health. But then these last set of verses teach us how to defeat that and how to overcome that worry and those destructive sins. Verse 31 tells us to seek his kingdom first, which often means letting go of our possessions. It seems counterintuitive, but by letting go, we turn to God and trust him to provide for us and take care of us. 
Then, as verse 32 states, our Father in heaven loves us and delights to give us his kingdom. He looks forward to that. He wants to take care of us. And it's his kingdom in heaven, not here on earth, that we're working for. In verse 33, it explains that we should not hold on to our earthly possessions because they could be stolen, destroyed, they lose their value. Instead, set our sights on his kingdom. Verse 34 summarizes everything by saying, where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. That reminds me of Hebrews 13, verse 5. It says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Instead, he tells us exactly where our hearts should be. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul, and with all your strength, which was Matthew 12, verse 30. That's one of my favorite verses. It tells us that he should reign as number one in our lives because we're called to love him with our entire being. Now, that's the end of our focal verses, so let's move on to some questions to reflect on. How can we balance the idea of trusting in God to meet all of our needs, meaning we shouldn't be worried, with our calling by God to work hard in everything we do? Well, definitely not an invitation to sit around all day, play an Xbox, and do nothing. Many places in the Bible tell us work is important. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul tells his listeners that if anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. And let's read Proverbs 6 together because it directly addresses laziness. So turn in your Bible to Proverbs 6, and I'm going to read out the CSB version. So verse 6 says, Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. Now if we go down to 9 through 12. It says, How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, and your poverty will come like a robber, your need like a bandit. And these verses say we should not be lazy. Instead, we have heard advice from our parents, our coaches, many times, do your best. God will take care of the rest. <clears throat> so how do these verses challenge you when it comes to worrying about everything in your life? We all have some worry about some at sometimes. Um, I feel like you probably have a lot less worry than I do, so this is definitely a question for me. Let's talk about it first in the context of money. Money doesn't necessarily make us worry less. As a matter of fact, it's probably the opposite. America is among the richest in the world, yet we are obsessed and overcome with worry, especially right now. Actually, money isn't helping us. The more money we have, the more you worry because we're worried about how to keep it. We're worried about how to manage it. We're worried about how to maximize it and get even more money so we do even better for ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong. Money's not evil in itself. It's that love of money and the desire for money that causes us to turn away from God and worry about things that are out of our own control. Now, with all we have going on in the world right now, it's easy to find yourself worrying about things. For example, with me, I worry about how's the economy going to be affected, what businesses might be affected, and what individual business owners that could even be my friends, which ones of those might have to close their doors because of everything going on right now. I also think about what's going to happen this fall with school. What do I have to do to help these kids? How has online learning and the hold harmless policy affected them with their learning? And what do I need to do as a teacher to help get them back on track? All of this stuff is a concern for me. And then I even start to think about the future. And I think about, well, last year was really rough on the graduating seniors. Is it going to last so long that it affects this year's graduating seniors? And even more than this year's seniors and this year's school year, what about the future of our youth? What about their faith? Because during this time, they've not been able to meet as a Sunday school class. And for many months, we weren't able to meet as a youth group. We're losing connections, and that's a concern. Now, all of that stuff can be so overwhelming to us as parents and even to you as kids. What we have to remember is we have to look at these verses and understand that those verses give us a lot of comfort right now. 
Those verses are some of my favorite, especially in these times, because it shows us that if God takes care of the smallest details like the sparrow or how the lilies of the field are going to be adorned more beautifully than King Solomon, if he is so concerned about those little details, then he is also concerned about us, his beloved. We need to find comfort in knowing that he's going to take care of us. So do we let our heavenly treasures influence the way we see our earthly treasures? Well, that kind of goes hand in hand with the question about worry and our discussion of worry. I find that when I'm reading my Bible, when I'm praying each day, and when I'm spending time with the Lord, I'm more focused on Christ and less focused on me and my life. I'm constantly reminded at that point that he's the one in control, not me. It's kind of like you always tell me. It's not all about you, <laughs> and it's not. It's about him. It's about Christ, our Redeemer and Provider. He's the one in control, and this is his plan. It's our duty to follow his plan for our lives, and that's to become his disciples. As long as we keep remembering that this is the world he created and that we're working for his kingdom, the treasures of the world are simply instruments to do his work. You know, the house we have, the job we have, those are things that God is going to provide for us so we can use it to help others or to help further his kingdom. We don't need to be greedy and selfish, but we do need to take care of those earthly treasures, not for our own advancement though, we're to take care of them to advance the kingdom of Christ. Okay, so to kind of sum it up, how do we keep God as our main treasure? First thing is to stay plugged in, read your Bibles at home, prayer, and continually stay plugged in with these virtual classes, the Wednesday nights, and with each other. As Christians, we need to stay connected with each other to lift each other up, keep us strong in faith, and just to keep us committed to what we need to be focused on. You're exactly right. These verses are a great reminder of our true treasure in heaven and what we need to continue to stay focused on and not focus on the worries of this world. And like you said, we need to stay connected with each other and uh, need to continue to lift each other up through this time. These are great verses for this week, and I'm very thankful that we were here to help talk through those with you guys. So thanks for joining us this week. We really do Thank appreciate you. that. And hopefully we'll see you all again really soon. And if you need anything, reach out for us. We are here for you. That's our, our doors open all the time. That's why we have that house we have is so others can come and find rest when they need it. So Kelly, would you close us in prayer? Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the treasures that you'll have in heaven for us. <laughs> Take our worries and just let them be restful. Let them know that you've got this and you're, gonna, you're in control of all of this and everything is in your plan. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Bring us together as soon as you can. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye, everyone.